Take Back Your Health Now, Episode 90. Information contained in this podcast is not medical advice. It is for educational and informational purposes only. Please consult with your doctor before making any health choices. You're listening to the Take Back Your Health Now podcast, the show that interviews the top doctors, athletes, trainers, and entrepreneurs to help you find the holy grail of health. Now here's your host, Dr. Dan Margolin. Hi, this is Dr. Dan Margolin with another segment of Take Back Your Health Now, where we pull out all the stops in search of health's holy grail. Today we're excited we have Dr. William Pollock. He is a board-certified family physician with training in acupuncture, homeopathy, and body work. He practices holistic medicine in Baltimore and appears regularly on the radio WCBM.com. In addition, he's a national expert in the medical use of electromagnetics with over 22 years of experience. In recognition of this experience, he has appeared on the Dr. Oz show regarding magnetic therapy devices. As part of his work with this technology, he has authored numerous books, including Power Tools for Health. Uh, he's written articles, chapters, and interviews on magnets, conducts, conducts research on the use of various kinds of electromagnetic systems on wound healing and other application and teaches practitioners on the appropriate use of magnetic therapies. Dr. Pollock, how are you, sir? Great. Thank you very much for uh, having me on your podcast. I look forward to our discussion. I'm excited to, to, to do so. So, you know, I, I, over the years, I've heard a lot about the use of magnets. And, and even in my own practice, we've we've experienced uh, and tried some different things. Tell us how you first got started with magnets. Go go into a little bit of the history of it and what you found like so exciting, I guess, about this field. Uh, that, that's a really actually an, an important question because you're right. This is kind of a, a left field endeavor, if you will. You know, where out of left field did I come from? <laughs> And uh, to me, it really was a left field experience. So what happened is uh, early on in my career as a family physician, I began to realize that, you know, after uh, many, many patients having all kinds of complications and side effects from the medications that we use for pain, and then proximate to the time that I just went on a different journey, um, what I found is a number of patients had almost died or in fact one or two did die of mm. GI bleeding from ibuprofen. Isn't that something? Like you would think that that's a relatively benign thing, but no, you hear that all the time. And in fact, actually, most people are not aware. I, I call it, there's two epidemics going on in this country. One I call the silent epidemic, and one is the one that's public, that's getting all the media attention these days, which is the opioid epidemic. Right, right. But the silent epidemic, People don't realize that 17,000 people a year die from GI bleeding, from gastrointestinal bleeding, from ibuprofen. Oh, my. I had no idea. 17,000. Can you imagine? Wow. So, so when I did my little journey, I said, well, I have a number of patients who, were almost, who died or almost died from ibuprofen with GI bleeding. And then we know that, GI, that uh, ibuprofen and aspirin and all these non-steroidal anti-inflammatories also cause kidney problems. Right. For people who are taking them um, o over time, if you have more than 3,000 grams of ibuprofen in a lifetime, you have a 400% four, increased risk of blowing out your kidneys. Wait a second. 3,000 grams? How, how many pills would that equate to? Well, let's, let's use an example. Yeah. If a woman used ibuprofen for five days or seven days of her cycle, every cycle of her life, her menstrual life, from right. say age 15 up to about age 50, most likely she would have exceeded, she would have exceeded that amount. Oh. She used ibuprofen every day of her cycle for those, for those years. She would have exceeded that 3,000 grams. 800 milligrams a day is almost a gram, right? Yeah. So you have a lot of people who are in chronic pain, and there are 100 million people in the U.S. with chronic pain. If you're using wow. over around a gram a day of the, you know, 800 milligrams, which is a standard medical dose. Right, right. That's not a crazy dose by any means. It's not. And so very quickly, you can run into all kinds of renal problems. 400% chance of wiping out your kidneys. Wow. Never mind the GI bleeding problem. 
Now, Dr. Fowler, like this, this is so shocking to me. It's not shocking that you have this. We knew that. I just didn't know what the what the levels were, what the dosage were, and the fact that that most people could potentially reach that in their lifetime. So basically, everybody's at risk. Are, is the medical community aware of this? Like how? I mean, I'm a doctor. I I didn't know that these these numbers existed like that. Well, I you know I knew it. Not only I knew it because I had these patients, but I had this experience with these patients. But then, as I started looking at the science. Uh, all of a sudden, it started to become more and more clear. There was a lot more discussion in the medical literature about GI bleeding from nonsteroidals. And that's a more proximate problem. In other words, it happens very quickly. Even if you give aspirin IV, people still get GI bleeding. Huh. Unbelievable. It doesn't have to be ingested. You could give it rectally. You could give it IV, and it still causes GI bleeding. Wow. Why is that? Well, because it affects the mucosa, and it's part of the, uh, uh, the, ox the cyclooxygenase system. Okay. Uh, because it affects the, the cyclooxygenase in different ways, and, you know, we thought that there were certain medications that come up that came out that would protect the GI tract from bleeding, which turns out not to be the case. It simply decreases the risk, but it doesn't eliminate the risk. And, and it's a substantial risk. I mean, you're not joking around. No, 17000 a year just from GI bleeding. When you add together the liver problems that you have for Palinol, you add together the kidney problems from, again, nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories, really that number is actually staggering. It's bigger than the opiate number. Wow. Wow. So so you think to some degree we've been sort of directed from the, the media and stuff towards this opiate problem and we've been directed away from the, the big money and, and more of the pharmaceutical problem? Because it's subtle. And in fact, you rarely find opiate, I mean, uh, ibuprofen cause of death uh, on the death certificate. It's GI bleeding. It doesn't list oh, why okay. you had the GI bleeding. Gotcha. What, what gets the public's attention is that people OD on the opiates. Gotcha. It's an immediate death that happens from, from a problem that's actually been going on for a long time. You know, as people escalate their opiate dosing, and uh, probably something like 60% of the opiate deaths are caused by prescription opiates. Unbelievable. You know, I, I unfortunately, I don't have the name of the study or the, of the doctor that actually did it, but there was a study done in, in the early 2000s, and the concept of this study was to find out, there was to compare the, the, the United States in terms of its ability to deliver great health care as compared to 17 other uh, countries, basically. And as she started doing, the doctor that started doing the study, uh, it changed from how great it was to actually how poor it was. And as she how was doing the study, how and how dangerous it was. it was. And she started to list out the thousands, tens of thousands of deaths that were being caused by properly uh, given uh, drugs. Yep. Yeah, and, and it was in the hospitals, okay? And then years later, she was going to do a follow-up study, but she was killed by the same thing. She, somebody gave her a dosage that, of medication that interacted with another dosage, and she died and could not finish the second study. So there are people aware of it. I mean, it's pretty shocking. Well, and of course, it, it, it is suppressed that people don't want to, the media don't want to bring this up because the media are largely supported by the drug companies. Yeah. They don't want to hear, so they don't want to hear about these alternative therapies. They don't want to hear about other options. And that's how I got started. So go back to your original question. That's how I got started with magnetic field therapies. What I did is I said, I have to go outside the house of medicine. I can no longer look at my peers or look at my consultant colleagues and say, well, do you have a solution for this pain? I already knew what the solutions were. They were non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. They were opiates. They were procedures. So there were lots of toxic solutions. And right. they clearly, so they clearly were not good solutions. So I started studying acupuncture through a program for physicians uh, through UCLA. And while I was doing that program, now this is going back a ways, uh, this was 1990, uh, as I was studying acupuncture and I tried to do acupuncture, people at that time were not open to acupuncture at all. Okay. Stay away from me from that, with that needle. I don't want that needle. Right, right, right. Solu with a different solution. I'm used to pills. Don't come up, don't, <laughs> don't come to me right, with that needle. Right, right. Understood. <laughs> so I started looking at other ways of doing acupuncture other than using needles. And now, Dr. Pollock, let me just ask you, when you're, when you're saying you're, you're starting to treat patients, 
what specifically were you looking to treat? Like, what were the things that you were seeing that the patients were running through? Was it more pain or oh, arthritis? It was pain. What was it was pain. It was. Okay, gotcha. It was the primary t- t- generation of my going on a journey outside the house of medicine. Okay. Managing pain. Gotcha. Because that's what ibuprofen is used for primarily, right? Is pain. Yeah. So when I did acupuncture, it was primarily for pain management. Of course, acupuncture can be used for a whole lot of other things. But I discovered that magnets, they were using magnets in the Orient. And I started using magnets on acupuncture points. And lo and behold, I discovered she did EMG testing, uh, nerve conduction testing with magnets on acupuncture meridians. And bingo, you know, they had an effect instead of needles. Because sometimes you can't do needles in children. And right. some people obviously don't want needles. And so the, the Oriental cultures, China, Japan, Korea, they discovered that magnets used on acupuncture points could have significant acupuncture benefits. Okay. So that's how I got started. So I started working with small, tiny magnets on acupuncture points and started seeing all kinds of benefits. Then I said, well, being a curious person, being somewhat academically oriented, I said, well, why? Why is this happening? What's the mechanism? And then as I started doing more research, I discovered that a lot of the science behind this was actually behind the Iron Curtain. Really? So it was, it was in Russia. Now, why is that? Why is that? Um, well, I sort of jokingly tell people, more, and had more engineers in Russia than they had pharmacologists. <laughs> Understood. In other words, they couldn't afford the drugs, but they had Understood. lots of engineers. Yes. Right? So you can develop yeah. devices that do something similar in the body. And they had a better sort of sense, a bioengineering sense, and how uh, electromagnetic fields, electrical fields, could affect the body. And so they developed more technologies to the body, affect the body through that mechanism. So by, by necessity, they moved in that direction. Understood. Doc, let me ask you a question. Just going back to the acupuncture for one second, and, and these are – are those called meridian points, the points where the, the acupuncture is actually done? Yes. Acupuncture is done on points, acupuncture points, and they're well over 600 in the body. Most acupuncture points, but not all, on, on acupuncture meridians, and there are 12 meridians in the body. So when you stimulate an acupuncture point, you then create a, a wave of energy moving down the acupuncture meridian. So conceive of it as, as basically... Uh, you plugging in um, a source of energy in your home into an outlet. Okay. Not only can you power your outlet, but if your source of energy actually creates more energy than receives, then that energy goes back into the power line system. Okay. Wow. So with acupuncture, you're basically putting energy locally, you're creating a current, an injury current locally, but at the same time, you're creating current flowing in back into the meridian system. That meridian system has a 24-hour clock, and physics has been the physics has been described. What happened? What happens is it's a DC current system. It's not flowing along a nerve. It's not flowing along a blood vessel. Okay. It's a collection of the way the anatomy of the body works to be able to create charge and energy flowing through the body. It's complicated, but basically, it's another circulatory system in the body. How how did they figure this out? I mean, you're you're not talking about something that's not accepted anymore. I mean, I know years ago in the '80s this was not accepted, but now I mean, I've read articles in in, in some of the medical literature where they completely pr- have proven this to be the fact. They, oh, they there is more science to prove the validity of acupuncture than there is to prove the validity of ibuprofen and aspirin. Huh. Wow. How did they figure this out? This is going back hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Well, no, actually thousands of years. Thousands of years. Okay. How did um, they do that? You know, the Chinese have been using acupuncture for probably 3,000 years. Wow. So how, you know, who knows, where, what, the who knows start, yeah. what the start of this was. I have a, I have a, uh, a cartoon on, on my wall that shows cavemen throwing um, uh, spears onto a mastodon. And the mm-hmm. mastodon is saying in his head, the little, uh, you know, cartoon caption, oh, my back pain is better. <laughs> so that's how I'm going to write that down. So that is how they originally did it. Huh? Oh, who knows? 
I love it. I love it. So, uh, all right. So, so, have, so you could have a, a theory, uh, you know, that aliens came down and downloaded this information to us. Sure, sure. Well, you know, and I've seen, listen, I've seen patients, a good friend of mine, I've seen uh, rid his Achilles tendonitis from acupuncture. I've seen another woman got rid of her migraine. She was just in last week and was telling me how great acupuncture was. So you switch over from acupuncture now and you switch over to this pulsed electromagnetic fields. So and what happened then is my the genesis and the origin of the journey um, was the acupuncture and acupuncture in 1990 because Americans were not ready for it. I started working with magnets and discovered that magnets stimulate acupuncture points and meridians. Even the Chinese knew this. And as I started working with it, I began to discover that magnets have a dual benefit, one of which acupuncture does not have. Hmm. The acupuncture points and meridians, acupuncture stimulation treats the whole system in the body, helping the regulance of, of energy flowing in the tissues, the sympathetic parasympathetic flows, uh, stimulation of endorphins and enkephalins in the brain. There's a whole lot of physiologic effects of acupuncture stimulation. But the major benefit of magnets is they, they treat the tissue locally. Explain that. Explain. When you put a magnet on your thumb, let's say you, you have a, a sore, sore spot on your thumb and you put a magnet on it. That magnet will actually stimulate circulation, reduce inflammation, stimulate RNA and DNA, increase ATP in the area of the magnet. All the cells in the area of the magnet are now getting energized. Okay. Do their job to be healthy. Do you, do wow. You, but uh, okay, magnets okay. are limiting. They're limiting okay. because they don't go very deep. The Earth's magnetic field is about half a gauss. A gauss is a measurement of magnetic field intensity. The Earth's magnetic field that we're all bathed in constantly, totally, completely, and you know, 24 hours a day. Right. is a half a gauss on average. To exceed that, to exceed that well, you could actually increase the magnetic field intensity to the tissue, but there's a law of physics called the inverse square rule, where the magnetic field intensity, any the intensity of any radiated field, whether it's radiation, ionizing radiation, or light or sound, decreases by something called the inverse square rule, or inverse square law. So what happens is that as you go deeper and deeper, the magnetic the magnetic field gradually loses intensity. Once, oh, I understand. Okay, once it gotcha. reaches the intensity of the background field of the Earth, a half a Gauss, it's no longer active. Okay. In other words, it's not providing you any more benefit than the background field of the Earth, which completely penetrates your body. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you've got to you've got to have magnets that are are far stronger. 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 Than that. Exactly. Much stronger. And pulsed electromagnetic fields solve that problem. They do. Now, now, what's the difference? Just tell me the difference. Is, is it that pulsation of the magnet that allows it to penetrate deeper? It's frequency. It's frequency. Okay. All right. So um, there are different frequencies. Microwaves that we get from our cell phones do penetrate into the body. But they're like a microwave, like a microwave oven. They heat because they're absorbed by the body. The wavelengths are so extremely short, they don't penetrate the body. As you lengthen the wavelength, as you make the wavelength longer, those wavelengths penetrate the body completely. Okay. So in other words, something like 300 megahertz, which is still a fairly high frequency, is the length of the body, top to bottom, top to bottom from head to bottom. Right, right. That's three meters. Once you get below that in terms of frequency, the wavelengths become extraordinarily long. So that means the body does not stop the magnetic field. Gotcha. It passes all the way through. And is that is that desirable? Yes. Okay, I understood. So you want you get now you're really getting into that frequency that is absolutely able to penetrate, and now's when you start to see the real therapeutic effects of this. That's correct. So magnetic fields are based on, the effect of magnetic fields is based on something called Faraday's law. The higher the intensity of the magnetic field, the more charge is created in the tissues. In other words, the, the magnetic field interacts with all of the ionic structure. Body. Right. And what cell doesn't have ions in it? No, I mean, your body is basically an electromagnetic field. It's a complete 
electromagnetic field. And Faraday's law and Gauss's law say that all electromagnetic fields interact. And we have a stronger magnet than what the body produces, then the body becomes charged by the magnetic field. Char using char using charge, you stimulate repair processes. Wow. I never I never imagined it like that. That makes total sense. Now, if you take a healthy cell, a healthy cell has its own magnetic field. If you stimulate it with a relatively low intensity magnetic field, it'll say, Oh, it was I was tickled. Wasn't that nice? <laughs> but then he says, okay, well, I'm done. I move. On. But if a cell is he not healthy, if it's stuck in its health, it's not balanced, charge, ionic charge builds up on the outside of the cell because the membrane channels, and there are hundreds of membrane channels, the membrane channels become stuck. Charge builds up on the outside of the cell, largely through calcium ion channels, potassium and sodium ion channels. Those channels have to open up for a dialogue between, dialogue between the interior and the exterior. Once you open okay. the channels, then all of a sudden everything equilibrates. Charge builds up inside the cell that causes the energy to be able to be transferred to ATP and the mitochondria. Wow. Is, so you're, this, you're, pow you're basically power charging the cells. You're power charging. That's why I call the book Power Tools for Health. It's oh, a double very meaning, smart. Double meaning. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, Doc, what, what conditions are we talking about? So you, you power charge these cells. They are now more capable of doing what in terms of health? And tell us about that. So, yes. Um, in our book, I have over 500 references. The first one of the sec the second chapter of the book is basically talking about how affect fields affect the body, the different mechanisms. So we talked about improving circulation. We talked about improving charge in the tissues, stimulating RNA and DNA, increasing ATP, etc. So there are t over 25 different mechanisms that magnetic fields have in stimulating the tissues. So if you take that, those mechanisms, and you apply them to virtually any health problem, what happens to the body? You get healthy. It rebalances. Yeah. But because we're a society that's focused on disease, and if you got this disease, you use this solution. If you have that problem, you use this solution, right? It's a single drug for a single problem. Right? You have to have a code, and then you just apply the solution. And that's what the drug companies, the pharmaceutical companies approve. Please approve. Right. Well, we want to get beyond that. The body is extraordinarily complex. We have to move beyond the diagnosis and say, well, the, what's the diagnosis comprised of? It's a comprised of the following physiologic, pathophysiologic, and pathologic issues. When we do that, then we understand the mechanisms of PEMFs. We know that they will then affect the cells and the tissues in the phase. But if you go beyond that and say, okay, fine, I have arthritis, or I have pain in my back, or I have... Uh, scleroderma, or I have hepatitis, or I have eye, it, uh, irritable bowel. Whatever the source of pain might be, what we're doing is we're actually healing the tissue. We're not treating so, pain. So it's, it's really, I mean, you know, the show is about looking for the holy grail of health. So what you're saying is really that, that you are not just necessarily trying to fix the disease state. You're trying to, one, prevent it, and two, probably even healthy tissues can be made healthier if I, you know what I mean? Like, how would this affect somebody that's an athlete that wanted to perform better in sports, for instance? Who can't use help after age 21? <laughs> sure. So, so um, what happens then is that the body is aging after age 21 or so. When we stop growing, the body's aging, automatically aging. That was a discussion that you had on your ASEA piece. Right, yes. Right? The body's aging. Once the body starts aging, then um, you have to be able to help the body energetically to be able to resolve the aging process. It's aging because it doesn't have the energy to be, be aging. PEMF therapy increases the amount of ATP in the cells. It builds ATP. But more than almost any other therapy, it not only increases ATP, it hydrolyzes the ATP which means what does that mean? it causes what is the ATP to actually turn into energy. Oh, I understand. Okay. So ATP is not energy. It's a precursor to, precursor to energy. 
Yes. So this is actually so, – so how – so let, let's take it from that viewpoint, right? So you have this ATP. We're going to tr- we're going to hydrolyze it and turn it into energy, but then when that will use up some of the ATP. So how often could you do this so that you're not necessarily depleting the body of the ATP? Do, do you follow what I'm saying? Exactly. Is there, Except is- that PEMFs complete the once you've hydrolyzed your ATP. If you follow this cycle of ATP production, what it does is basically turns the hydrolyzed ATP and goes back and uses ATP ases to regenerate more ATP. Okay, so you're, you're actually speeding the cycle up for the most exactly. part. Exactly, and it's continually. Now, continually, continually happening. So what you have to do is you have to make sure that the body has all the precursors. Okay, and what would, so what are the precursors? Well, minerals, gotcha. proteins, fats, carbohydrates, all the normal nutrients that the body needs to, to, to fulfill itself. Magnetic field therapy, you can't build a house without bricks and mortar. Magnetic therapy gotcha. helps to build a house, but you need the bricks and the mortar. Gotcha. If you break a bone and it wants to heal, if you do surgery, like, like a podiatrist would, right, on, the, on, a, on a big toe, osteotomy. Yes. In order to repair that toe, the body has to have the tools to do the repair work. No question about it. It has to have all the nutrients in place. And if it doesn't, then the repair process is slowed down. And other than, say, the, the, you, have, you have non-unions in the body, fractures that won't heal. Why don't they heal? Because they're lacking energy or they're overused. So okay. the FDA actually approved magnetic therapy devices 25 years ago to heal non-unions, even non-unions that have been there for seven years or, or longer. You know, we have a, we, they're called bone stimulators, right? We're using one on a patient that came in a while ago. For, uh, she has a fifth met fracture that is non-healing. So I guess it's the same concept that you're speaking exactly. about. Exactly. And I'll give you an example. Uh, my wife, actually, um, and being a proselytizer that I am for the technology, my wife broke her little toe. Her fifth metatarsal, and it was like mm-hmm. it was angled out at probably about thirty degrees. Oh wow! And so I said, "Well, it's a fracture." She said, "Let's go get an X-ray and see how bad." Oh no, no, no! Oh no, no! I don't want to do that. So what I did is I body taped it, put her in a platform shoe, put a portable magnetic system on her foot, battery operated, portable. Wow. She used it twenty four seven. Next morning, she woke up, zero bruising, zero swelling. Continued to use it for another 24 hours. The next morning she woke up. She walked, she walked, she walked a mile in tennis shoes. Wow. Did it for another 24 hours. The following morning she woke up and walked three miles in tennis shoes and then never looked back. Unbelievable. Dr. Pollock, so, so you are really it, – it's not just that, honestly, you're, 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 you're giving forth this concept of – Pulse electrical magnetic fields. I mean, as the doctor, you're also concerned with the nutrition. I mean, you're really looking at a broad uh, aspect of this patient, right? So when they're coming into you, if I were to come to you with a, with a problem, right, what would be the most common thing that you're seeing? I got pain, but what type of pain would, would you most mostly be seeing? Um, in my practice, because I have mostly a holistic practice, I mean, I don't work in the ER. I'm not a podiatrist or, or a chiropractor or an orthopedic surgeon. My practice, yes. my practice is not predominantly musculoskeletal, but obviously my okay. patients have everything. Okay. Um, so the, back, so, the so pain I, patients that I tend to, the patient, patients that I see that have pain are abdominal, their shoulders, their backs, their elbows, their hands, you know, and so on. So how would you, how would you work them up and, and how would you decide like how much of the pulse electromagnetic field they would get? How much in terms of nutrition? Like, how would you balance those things out? Well, the first thing I do is go over their entire history and look at their diet, what they're eating. I get an A1C. I get a homocysteine. I do the, the usual sort of functional medicine workup. Okay, just for the audience, the A1C is for the diabetes. Just to That's make correct. It's a three-month sure. average of the blood sugar, you know, uh, what it's doing, what it's doing. And homocysteine measures the amount of, uh, it, it can measure um, inflammation in the body, but it also measures the body's capacity to uh, have better circulation, if you will. Okay. So you do all that and you say, okay, fine, you were going to need to fix your diet because you've got these other risk factors going on. 
Then because you've got your back pain, we're going to need to give you some anti-inflammatories. So anti-inflammatories could be curcumin or Mariva, uh, uh, um, curcumin or turmeric with bioparine. Um, and then supplying them with basic minerals, a good multivitamin, vitamin D, um, a, a EPA, DHA, in other words, fish oil. So hmm. Put them on a basic protocol. If they have a fracture, then I have to use bone building uh, nutrients. Okay. To help make sure they they could repair they could repair it. If they don't have the nutrients, and you could also add collagen to this because PEMFs increase collagen, and bone is made out of collagen too. Sure. So put them on on a, on a protocol. Then you add the magnetic therapy and say it's going to help you with your pain almost instantly. But our goal is not to help you with your pain. I mean, that's a nice thing to do is to reduce your pain. But our ultimate goal is to reduce the cause of the pain to the extent that we can. And we're not always successful with that. But, you know, to a great uh, degree, we can. And I see patients all the time get off all their meds. Wow. And and when you're saying that, how intensely are they under this post-electromagnetic field? I mean, is it something that they would apply several hours a day? Is it 15 minutes? Like, how does that work? Um and that's a not, that's a not, that's another whole discussion. To some extent, that's in the book as well. We we talk about how okay. how to use it, you know, how best to use it, and how to get the best advantage. Of it. So it does. It varies depending on the situation. It varies depending on the person. There's no pretty much standard like everybody goes for this amount. It's pretty much varied, and that's really, I guess, dependent on the individual. The rule of thumb is that the stronger the magnetic field, the shorter the treatment time. So what happens is gotcha. get a magnetic get a magnetic system um, that's inexpensive. And when it's inexpensive, it's going to take longer to work. When I was on the Oz show, Dr. Oz was enamored of, of some devices that were very inexpensive. Um, but when I reviewed them, um, I found that they were disposable, which means that they would have to be used for hours and hours at a time. And then they'd have to buy another set in about you know four weeks. Oh, okay. That's not a good idea. Because people get frustrated. Well, they, they're expecting that, that because they bought something inexpensive and it's got this great reputation that all of a sudden it was going to cure everything. But they have to understand the natural processes of the body in terms of healing. Because it's working through the natural processes of the body to heal itself. So higher intensity magnetic fields work faster and low, than, low, than low intensity magnetic fields. Most of the time, my emphasis for most people, because most of the patients that I see have chronic problems, like low back pain or uh, plantar fasciitis. Mm -hmm. Plantar fasciitis is not a one-day problem. Yes. No, absolutely. For the audience, that's the, the, the tendon or the fascia on the bottom of the heel, and people present a lot of times with pain with the first step in the morning and that kind of thing. But yes, it is a long-term problem a lot of so times. So you have to see this as a problem that's likely to recur, even though you've done successful treatment. If you don't take care of all the factors that caused it in the first place, it's likely to come back. So my whole goal is to get people to own a magnetic system. Because I say to people that when you own a magnetic system, you don't own it. The house owns it. <laughs> including the dog, the cat, and the plant. Gotcha. Gotcha. Because it treats pets. My, my pets, my, my, I have two Westies, and my Westies fight with my wife for time on the magnetic system. Wow. So this is really like you exercise, you work out. I mean, this is part of that daily routine. Ideally, if you were doing it every day, then you're essentially cleaning up business before it becomes a problem. Let me give you more. more. We have 100 trillion cells in our body. Let's put our heads around that. A hundred trillion cells in our bodies. Wow. If your left little toe decides to get a hangnail, how many cells have to be damaged before you even notice that you have a hangnail? A lot of cells. Tens of millions. Yeah. Doing then, and when you're doing then, and when you're doing magnetic field therapy on a regular basis, the cells are getting charged and energized. If you're doing whole body therapy, they're getting uh, stimulated. Every day, every time you use the magnetic system, you're stimulating those cells. If you're stimulating before they're to a point where you notice that there's a problem, they're reversing the damage that's already beginning to happen. It's almost, I mean, it almost sounds like an anti-aging type mechanism. It absolutely right? has I mean, that capacity as well. So once you buy it for your back pain and you use it on a regular basis, 
for your back pain, your whole body's getting benefit from it. And it is anti-aging. I absolutely agree. Dr. Falk, let me ask you a question. If you were talking to your old self, you know, 20 years ago when you were back in sort of regular medicine and, and, and now looking back on it, what would you say? Like, how, how did it turn out? How far off were you originally and how far have you come? I, I would say I had no idea. I would say I was stupid. I mean, I knew what I knew, and I'd already been practicing medicine for 10 years or 12 years. And looking back now, what I know about what PEMFs do is, I mean, this is, this is why I say this is the revolution. It's a revolution that's been helping, the, been helping the body to be healthy. And I really, at the beginning, I had no idea all the different things that it could do. And that's ultimately, again, why I published the book. And... Just, you know, as we come to the end of the talk, I always uh, ask our guests what they consider the holy grail of health to be. And probably it's, it's something you've already gone over. But just if you would summarize it, what, what do you think the holy grail of health is for our audience? Um, I don't think there is. I think okay. the holy grail is G-O-D. G-O-D, God, yes. Gotcha. Uh, you know, because I think everything that we do, no matter what we do, whether it's diet, nutrition, electrical therapy, um, redox therapies, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what we do. They all have a place. And in my in my practice, people do get overwhelmed often because I advise so many different things to pr to provide a complete picture of healing. And you know, my philosophy basically is it takes a village. Wow. You know, no one person has a, has the complete solution. You know, and I have to say, having done this show now, and, and we're close to 90, I guess, different shows, um, and spoken to all these amazing individuals and people really on the cutting edge, uh, yeah, there's a lot of pieces, and it's really like putting together pieces of a puzzle. And, and, you know, sometimes you talk to people and you go, yeah, they don't really have it. So, and then some people you're like, oh, my God, they've got this amazing part of this puzzle right here. But, um, but it is a puzzle, and there are a lot of pieces. I totally agree. So your, your book is Power Tools for Health. And my website, for people who are interested, Power Tools is going to be out for another month. So in the meantime, if people want to get information, they can go to drpollock.com. That's D-R-P-A-W-L-U-K.com. Drpollock.com. Dr. Pollock, I want to thank you, sir, for a wonderful interview. It was awesome. I truly appreciate you being on the show. And I would uh, love to be back if you ever have a need. I would love to have you back. I'm going to hold <laughs> you to that. <laughs> Thank you. I look forward to meeting you personally one day. Sounds great, sir. This episode is sponsored by New Jersey Foot and Ankle Center in Orido, New Jersey. Remember, when you have a foot problem, you've got a foot doctor in the family. Weekend and evening appointments are available. Call us at 201-261-9445. Once again, that's 201 201- Two six one nine four four five. Thanks for listening. Check out the show notes over at drdanspeaks.com. If you're loving the show, head over to iTunes and leave us a review, and we'll catch you next time.